All right, everyone, we are live. So my name is Jesse Hildebrand and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home and joining in on YouTube. And so we so appreciate you tuning in as we continue to highlight amazing scientists, explorers, and organizations around the world. Today, I am really excited to be joining in on my first presentation with a group that I haven't worked with before. So today we are joined by Laura Diara, and she is the Duke Lemur Center Sava Conservation Liaison. So what is Sava? It is the region of northeastern Madagascar that's one of the most amazing biological hotspots in the globe. And in 2019, Laura spent six months there exploring this wild region, soaking up the culture, understanding the biodiversity, history, and more. And without further ado, I'm excited to turn it over to her to dive in with her presentation and showcase all that she learned while she was on site in one of the most amazing countries on Earth. Laura, thank you so much for joining us today and take us away. Absolutely. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. I am so excited to share my experiences. Um, as the Duke Lemur Center Sava Conservation Liaison, I encourage the cooperation and exchange of information between DLC and our collaborators by developing and implementing activities that are related to um, environmental education, uh, media, and conservation. Uh, my, mission, my mission is to ignite interest in ecological relationships and why protecting them is crucial to the intricate balance of the planet. So if you guys are ready, um, we're going to take a virtual tour of Madagascar. And right over here, you'll see Madagascar in the southeast, um, off the southeast coast of Africa, and it's the fourth largest island in the world. I know it doesn't look too big next to this massive continent, but here is um, Madagascar overlapped uh, over the United States to help you kind of grasp how enormous it is. Madagascar is famous for its unique biodiversity. There's an array of landscapes from rainforest to dry forests where the mythical baobabs grow, to spiny forests, not to be confused with cactus or a desert. This is a uniquely specialized tree ecosystem found nowhere else. And there's tons of plants and insects, many uh, amphibians and reptiles, lots of birds, and over 200 species of animal, animals, including over 100 species of lemurs, which everyone's real crazy about. But something that a lot of people don't know is that Madagascar is ranked third most ethnically diverse country in the world. With over 25 million people, it is divided into 18 major ethical, um, ethnic groups, each with their own customs and dialects. So here's a map of the traditional ethnic territories. And here's Madagascar. When traveling here, um, you have to enter through the capital city, Antananarivo, and that's a mouthful, so we're just gonna call it Tana. Um, it's a highly uh, urbanized um, area. Much of the land is degraded. These are flooded rice fields between the airport and the main city. And this is the heart of Tana, looking over Independence Avenue, known for its large markets and a gathering place for people. But there isn't much um, wildlife, with the exception of birds and um, insects. Here are a couple that I got to spot before we left, but um, we're not going to stay there long. <laughs> In Tana, there's a lot of crime and air pollution, and it's not exactly a hospitable condition. Lucky for us, the Duke Lemur Center Sava Conservation is based out of Sa Sambava in the Sava region of, north e of, the, nor of the northeastern coast of the country. So Sava is an acronym for the four major cities that um, make up the region. We have Sambava here in the middle, Andapa out west, Vuimar in the north, and Antla in the south. And together, the four of them form the Green Triangle. And it's called, called this because of its massive tree cover. It actually covers um, about 80% of the landscape. So from Tana, here in the capital, we're going to go up to um, Sava. And there's an airport in Zimbabwe. So in about two hours, um, you can get to this like tropical, uh, dense, beautiful, lush um, paradise. Zimbabwe means where the rivers flow into the sea after meeting each other. And here we can see them from the airplane. And remember this you, because I'm going to show you um, what it looks like from this bridge right over here. 
And as soon as you sit off the, the um, foot off the plane, you're greeted by green mango trees, palms, and zebu. Didn't have to go far to get my first zebu experience, um, but one of the national symbols of Madagascar. And I was so happy to be out of the big city. We were shocked when we found ourselves in a serious traffic jam. Turns out we landed on World Environment Day and there was a huge parade and they stopped traffic um, and asked everyone to turn off their engines. And I thought that it was going to be um, some sort of riot. And everyone was just so calm and cool and cooperative. It was just really amazing. It was a great introduction to the Malagasy phrase, mura mura, which means slowly, slowly. And it's basically a philosophy of life in Madagascar. So Zimbabwe is a melting pot of the surrounding ethnic people and the different communities live in relative harmony. Um, it's really beautiful. Uh, I have a, here's a glimpse of what it's like to go through a uh, town. Um, we're not really driving this fast, this is fast forward so you can uh, just kind of just get an idea. Um, but tuk-tuks are the preferred means of transportation here, and it's pretty awesome. They are uh, fuel efficient um, and much better than cabs. Now, just because you're in the city doesn't mean that uh, you're safe from uh, wildlife. You can't let, really let your guard down. This is still one of the most diverse ecosystems. And here is this interesting character that I found in the garden, and I want you guys to watch this. If you have ever been stung by a toxic caterpillar, you can't understand the level of respect that they deserve. These little animals can cause tremendous pain lasting hours and hours and sometimes even hospitalization. So you gotta be real careful. Um, and now we're gonna head from Sambava to Manantenina, which is a small village between Sambava and Andapa. And it is one of only two villages on the only road into Marajeji National Park, um, one of the gems of the area. So last year, DLC Sava facilitated the research of zoonotic diseases by Duke Global Health in collaboration with Bass Connections. This is our team. And here we are with DLC Conservation Director, Charlie Welch. And I accompanied the team for 60 days and documented everything. So this is where we met the Park Visitor Center. And as you can see, it's really just down the street from Manantenina. And here's the road that leads into the park. On the way there, I noticed a man carrying what looked like some tropical reef. And on closer inspection, I realized that it was vanilla. Um, the vanilla orchid is a large sturdy looking vine and they kind of just wrap it up like rope and take it out to their fields and then plant it in segments individually. Madagascar is the vanilla capital of the world, providing between 40 and 60% of the products and the majority of that vanilla is grown, cured, and sold in Saba. Vanilla is native to Mexico and there's no natural pollinator in Madagascar. It's all done by hand, primarily by the women. The whole production is meticulous and lengthy, involving a complex curing period, and the technique varies between farmers. So these bundles that you guys see right here, vanilla, those go for about $100 to $200, depending on the season, location, and quality. Um, but Zimbabwe also has another specialty, coconuts. Um, it's known um, for having very fertile lands and one of the largest coconut groves in the world, covering over 10,000 acres, which is about 5,000 football fields. And we continued and made our way up the hill and through the camp, um, through the village to where we would be living for the next two months. And as you can see, uh, we were on a hill that overlooked the entire village. There it is, that's Manantenina. Here we are arriving really tired and sweaty. And this is the house in which we lived in. There was no plumbing or electricity, but we had three home cooked meals every day. And we were in the safe hands of a veteran team. Um, Here's our first dinner by candlelight. And the very next day we went straight to work and the families came over and they greeted us and helped us set up. And it was great to meet everyone and um, learn a little bit more about the specific culture of the surrounding villages as well as the region. In total, there was about 18 people living there. 
um, at the same time, but with professors, students, doctors, veterinarians, and families coming through, we were really our own village tucked away in the forest. I was amazed by how everyone got along, and um, I never really experienced such a mild-mannered, easygoing culture, and I just can't imagine um, how anybody could stay mad in such a beautiful place. Um, you know, as I got to know our team better, I started to ask more and more questions, and I really wanted to get a better understanding of um, the ethnic uh, backgrounds of our team. And so I'm going to refer back to this map, um, and according to this, uh, Sava is dominated by the ethnic groups Betsy Misarika and the Tsimheti. Uh, but there's also a large population of Sakalava people from the West Coast. Um, they primarily live in Vuimar, which means where there are many villages, a former Islamic town. Um, it is drier and less dense than the rest of the Sava region, and their economy depends on Zebu and its mineral wealth. Sakalava means people of the long valleys, referring to their landscapes of the West Coast, and many have migrated to Vuimar from Diego. Here we see um, these beautiful uh, Sakalava women with their face masks. Traditionally, most Malagasy women of all the ethnicities wear different clay and turmeric masks, but the Sakalava are known for really um, intricate designs that they sport you know, um, on a daily basis. Then I found out um, about Andapa, which was not too far from us, and I was able to visit a couple times. And Andapa means um, at the place or at the command post where King Radama I built his camp um, during his expeditions. And this is the real rice basket for all of Saba. You see, rice is Malagasy's staple food. It's a real business, and in Andapa, it brings in just as much revenue as vanilla. Um, and their uh, dominant ethnic group are the Tsimheti, um, which means those who don't cut their hair. In Antala, down south, uh, the name means the place where the palm grows. And you can really find everything here, quarries, mangroves, rainforest. And the dominant ethnic group here are the Bitsimisarika, which means those who could not be separated, referring to not ever being divided by larger ethnic groups. In honor of World Africa TV, which is Africa's number one urban and music portal, soup pop superstar Rihanna posed um, for Vogue wearing the traditional hairstyle of the Betsy Masarika women. And the more we learned about it, um, learned about the culture and each other, the more we, more we got along. And it was just really great um, being surrounded by people who enjoy life and had similar interests. And we worked hard to play hard. Um, we looked at domestic and wild animals, you know, studying zoonotic diseases, not just about people. And we brought all this information together to try to understand how diseases are transferred in social networks. Uh, parasites were also investigated. Don't worry, no patients were harmed. Here we can see this pig that is being, um, search for ectoparasites and she is just happy as <laughs> a pig in mud eating um, leaves and grass as we uh, look for them. And you know the campsite was just booming with life. There were all sorts of insects and butterflies, uh, caterpillars, and I want to show you another caterpillar because <laughs> you really have to be careful with these. You see everybody talks about how Madagascar doesn't really have poisonous snakes or of spiders and how it's relatively, um, you know, not threatening, but caterpillars are everywhere. And I can't imagine what it must feel like to be stung by these. I've been stung by a North American pus caterpillar and that was just one of the most horrible experiences of my life. So check out for these, um, keep an eye out for them whenever you're making your way through Madagascar. And here we have um, some different birds that uh, the different guides found near the campsite would bring us to show us. It was just great um, being surrounded by senior park guides and people that really knew the land and it was just a never ending learning experience. Um, had a great time, got to see all sorts of cool stuff. I really love this, of this tiny little spider eating this dragonfly. Um, you really just can't underestimate nature. And 
one of my favorite things was the views, obviously. From the hill, um, every sunrise was different. And on a clear day, you could really make out the famous three peaks of Mara Jeji right here. 95% um, of the time, these peaks are in the clouds, not visible. Um, so we were very lucky to get those. And Mara Jeji was going to be our next destination. Um, it is about a mile and a half from the campsite, from the campsite to the park entrance, and the views along the way are absolutely stunning. Um, here is the Drungle, the king of birds, as he is called in Madagascar, because of his ability to mimic sound, and their crest makes for an unmistakable silhouette. Uh, here we have a strangler fig in the forest that is easily 100 feet tall. Um, and it's most people's favorite tree lying between camp one and camp two. And it's just absolutely enormous. In this picture, that wall you see behind us is actually the roots of the tree that are, you know, about seven to eight feet tall. And, you know, it was just fantastic. There were so many interesting things from, you know, animals to, you know, different pr uh, products that people use uh, from the forest. You know, the forest provides us with so many um, ecosystem services. And here, uh, Edward, our guide, was showing me this flammable sap that one of the trees produces. And it was just insane. It was like a firecracker. And we had tons of um, viewings of wildlife here. I love this. As you can see, I'm being swarmed by butterflies because there's mud all over my shoes and butterflies actually sip minerals from mud. And it was just amazing. It was like a fairy tale. I absolutely loved it. And of course, more caterpillars. I'm always on the lookout for small things and they are just absolutely diverse and beautiful and gorgeous. Um, this was one of, also one of my favorite finds. Everybody walked right by it and didn't notice that inside of this snail shell, there was a frog. And if you look carefully right there, you can see her tadpoles. See it? <laughs> it was awesome. It was just a little microcosm. Then shortly after this happened, good people of the earth, I present the helmet vanga, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in person. Um, this is just a lifer for anyone who is into birds. I was just ecstatic and crying when I captured a focused picture of him. Um, here's our Duarte, our guide. And before you know it, you know, uh, life was just coming out of, every, out of the forest. Um, we bumped into bamboo lemurs. This is Hapolemur occidentalis, uh, one of my favorite species. Uh, they're just very cute. Um, and here they are doing what a bamboo lemur does best, eating bamboo. So these lemurs have scent glands on their wrists, just like ring-tailed lemurs. And he really liked this bamboo shoot. And I captured him <laughs> rubbing his scent glands all over it. Um, it was just very cute. and. Uh, to share that. Um, and this cute little guy is a ferocious predator. <laughs> um, he is a ringtail mongoose and this carnivore is smart, mischievous, and fast. Do not leave any food where he is around. He cannot be trusted. And these beautiful animals are the white-fronted brown lemurs. These are two males. Um, brown uh, White-fronted brown lemurs are one of the few dichromatic species, meaning that males and females differ in color. So here we have the male on the left with the white mane around his face and the darker, more discreet female. We have, a, we have one more picture of this handsome fellow. And now we were headed up to camp two. Um, things started to get a little bit more wild, bigger trees, steeper climb, um, more moss and lichens. And we finally made it. And I was too exhausted to be completely aware of my surroundings. Um, I got tunnel vision and almost missed one of the most overwhelming views on earth. Um, and in these isolated forests is where we find the elusive silky shafak, Propithecus candidus, one of the most critically endangered animals. And we were fortunate enough to encounter a mated pair with their three week old baby. If you look over here in the right hand corner, the couple is just lounging and the baby sneaking a peek at me. I'm curious about what all that clicking sound is. 
there, I zoomed in on him for you. He was just absolutely precious. Uh, silky fish, uh, shifok are only found here in Sava and they are monogamous, but gentle vegetarians um, in desperate need of protection. They look like angels in the trees, angels in the trees, uh, without, whom without our protection would become ghosts in the forest. Now, Marajaji is constantly fighting to survive um, illegal logging due to the high demand of ebony and rosewood. So if you are listening, do Madagascar a favor and be an ethical consumer. Ask about the source of precious woods and gems and refuse them if they are not from a sustainable source. And seeing how these um, products can take centuries to mature, it's nearly impossible to pinpoint the source. So opt for an alternative or take a picture, but please, please, please don't encourage this catastrophe against mother nature. So I'm going to stop for just a moment and see how we're doing and take any questions. Fantastic. Well, Laura, this is like the coolest, I've been to Madagascar and this is the coolest tour of Madagascar I've ever seen. So very, <laughs> very cool. Um, wow, geez, the Caterpillar video, I've never seen anything like that in over 500 programs. So that is awesome. Um, <laughs> definitely to avoid it. So we've got people tuning in from Maryland, uh, Virginia, North Carolina, Mississippi, Massachusetts, all across Ontario, Canada, and more. So, so thrilling to have all you guys in. One of my first questions for you is, what prompted all this? Like, what got you into this to be inspired to go to Madagascar in the first place or to dive in with this sort of research? Is there anything that jumps out that, that I don't know, pushed you on this path? Well, I've, I've always been fascinated by primates. I started working with primates when I was 18 years old, and I have worked at different zoos and sanctuaries and private um, sanctuaries, um, as well as a tour guide in the Dominican Republic at a... Um, uh, a sanctuary for primates, for capuchins and monkey, um, squirrel monkeys. And um, actually, you know, this, uh, this move to Madagascar came because uh, we were presented with the, the opportunity to apply for these positions and, you know, not getting any younger. So might as well do it while I can. Um, it's definitely been on my list for a while. And so you, you've already shown quite a bit about the culture in Madagascar and, and uh, you know, I love this traffic jam picture and uh, the idea of let's all move very slowly together. Um, is there a piece of advice you'd share to someone who wanted to visit Madagascar, whether as a researcher or, or as a tourist, anything that jumps out to say, okay, from personal experience, this is what I make sure you understand before you go. Yes, um, something that I, per I personally can't live without is my Grail water filter water bottle. And it is just awesome. Um, every filter can last about 300 bottles of refilling it 300 times. And I have gotten water from rivers and, you know, uh, sketchy looking faucets and all sorts of places. And I just make sure to use it to brush my teeth and to drink water, to rinse off my face. And I, I count on myself to have purified water. This is something that I think is worth noting for a lot of field work that happens around the world is that, you know, in Canada and the U.S., we're really lucky. We can go to the tap and get really fresh, really clean water. Um, this is not the case for a lot of the world. And in Madagascar, this is something that's especially an issue for people coming in from afar. Um, and so uh, I'm really glad we got that message in. That's fantastic. All right. I'll take one question from YouTube and then we'll dive back in with your presentation because I know I want to see all these cool pictures. Uh, how many lemurs live in Madagascar? And you have to tell us the exact number. Laura, no pressure. <laughs> well, the exact number <laughs> is going to be difficult for me to say. Um, there's definitely over 100. And I would say that most people would agree there's about one, 120. Yeah, species of lemur, yep. And then a yeah. lot of them are endangered or, in, or having trouble. Is that correct? Yes, uh, just about all of them. So, uh, you know, a, a dire message, but something where we can highlight the importance of lemur conservation more generally and of protecting Madagascar on the whole. I mean, this is one of, as you said, the most biodiverse, unique regions in the entire world. And so, uh, yeah, I'm, you Absolutely. know what? I'm excited to dive back in with it. I'm sure we'll get many more questions when you've done your presentation, but I, we've left in this gorgeous beach. And I mean, <laughs> as much as I want to frolic there, um, let's uh, explore the rest of your tour. Because I mean, the six month journey is pretty incredible, Laura. So we're excited to dive back in. Absolutely. Awesome. So the next stop on our tour is going to be, 
All right. I don't know if you guys heard that, so I'm just gonna. The next stop on our tour is going to be in Antla, and I've been anticipating this for quite some time. Um, not just because it's beautiful, but because I was very eager to meet Maria Len, the founder and of of Macolin Botanical Reserve and the nonprofit Macolin Protection Association. And she aims to educate visitors and students alike on the biodiversity and fragility of endemic ecosystems. As a local icon of female empowerment, she is also the president of the Humanitarian Association Committee of Aid to the former lepers of Antala. She oversees the largest collection of indigenous and exotic trees and plants in Sava and facilitates the research and supports reforestation efforts through direct planting as well as providing collaborators with seeds and seedlings. Um, this was a school group that spotted a bat roosting in the shade of a tree um, in the middle of the day. You can see him right there, see his little ears wiggling. He is completely aware that we are there, but he's got his eyes closed and is napping. He knows we're not a threat. And it's just great to be able to, um, you know, have this experience with students where you really just don't know what you're going to encounter. And it's just always exciting. And this is the famous viewpoint of uh, overlooking the left and right rivers. Those are the actual names, left to the left and right to the right. And I have a video of it. There you go. Um, you know, overlooking this landscape, I was just amazed at all of Maria Lynn's accomplishments. Not only does she run this amazing facility, but she was also the first Malagasy woman to become a pharmacist and opened the first modern pharmacy in Antala, which still operates today and has become a pillar to the community. And I just absolutely was in love with everything she's done. And the park was gorgeous. She created and protected an oasis where beauty and conservation thrive. And you just see all sorts of rare animals like this frog and you know snakes that can be mistaken for branches. Here it is. Let me go back there in case you missed that. Right between the two trees, the snake is moving from one hole to the other. So this is where he came out on the other side. And there's one Antala resident that cannot be forgotten. This freaky faced insect is called the Sagunji. And we eat it, not just me, but it has been historically consumed by the people of Sava. It is delicious, nutritious, and most importantly, it is sustainable. In a country where so many su are suffering from malnutrition, this protein packed nutrition dense bugger could really change things. Would you try it? Salted and boiled is the way to go. Honestly, it tastes like bacon with the consistency of a hard boiled egg. So while we were visiting Antala, we also had the opportunity to visit the home village of our good friend and cursor professor, Fou Jans. And we traveled about two hours up this river um, to visit his family. And we were so honored. Um, they had never invited uh, foreigners to visit their village. And we enjoyed a traditional Malagasy dinner. Um, if you look in the back, these are traditional Betsy Masarika houses. And we also used uh, traditional Malagasy spoons made from folding the leaves of traveler's palms. We had such a lovely day with uh, his family and all of our friends. And I just love to reminisce about this. It was just really um, humbling and sweet. It was uh, one of the most sincere moments where you could just really see that everyone was just appreciating um, every moment that we had. There's James, <laughs> DLC Sava program coordinator. And that's us with the family. And our Antala trip is not complete without a visit to the University of Sava, known as CURSA. Uh, DLC Sava um, funds scholarships for two students to attend graduate school in the capital of Tana. And when we met them, we realized what amazing, vibrant, intelligent people they were. Our first mission with CURSA was to collaborate. And we put on a two week workshop in Marjaji National Park and in the classrooms to introduce the students to data collection and analysis, animal identification and polishing skills for scientific papers. And it was just absolutely fantastic. Here we are in front of that famous strangler fig of Maro Jeji. And we made it out to see the waterfalls um, uh, this is Waterfall Umber, about half mile from Camp One. And you'd think that with so many people, we'd be crazy to try to find animals. But everybody in this group was a proud nature nerd. And we were so focused on having a successful, efficient 
um, workshop, you know, us in, in the students were just as enthusiastic as we were. And let me tell you that all those eyes were so, it was such an advantage to have so many people. We were quiet, we were cautious, we walked gently and kept our eyes peeled and all, and it was just absolutely fantastic. I don't think any animals eluded us that week. We were on fire. Um, here we are spotting lemurs high up in the canopy. Um, here's Evra who is waiting for butterflies to catch with a sweet net. Um, we also used uh, traps with uh, fermented banana to catch butterflies, uh, but they were always released and no animal was harmed. Everything was just uh, to be able to really give these kids um, a hands-on experience. It's kind of insane that a lot of the people that live in uh, the Sava region have actually never had the opportunity to visit the national parks. And so uh, five nights and six days was, you know, a really great introduction to all of the diversity. I mean, look at these guys. These are chameleons and coming up is going to be one of my new favorite passions and that is uh, reptiles. I fell in love with the geckos of Madagascar. This is a common um, house gecko, gecko that you'll find in urban areas as well as the forest. And they come in different colors and shapes and sizes. But the first time that I saw um, a leaf-tailed gecko, it was over. I was just amazed. So in this next picture, check out, this is the same picture, the same animal on the same tree. And on the left is what you see um, with your uh, with the naked eye and I had to adjust my camera twice to be able to show him to you so you can really see how camouflaged he is and how easy it is to walk right by them and not even see them and they were just absolutely fantastic check out this next guy I was in love when I saw this I couldn't believe what a beautiful unique specimen it was um, he just looked like a varnished wood so gorgeous and look at that is that alien-like or what? This is another gecko. This is a much larger gecko. I would say that this is, a, you know, easily six to nine inches long. Um, looks more like an alligator. And this, this is a fascinating leaf-tailed gecko. This is a newly described species um, from Marojeji, and it is called Europlatus finaracha. And I love it. Check out that tail. Those holes are naturally occurring. It just looks like an old dried up leaf. And the face looks like something out of Pokemon. Um, here is another chameleon, one of the smallest uh, in the world. And that is probably about half the size of your pinky. We had a great time. We worked day and night and made use of every second we had together. And we came out um, stronger as a unit and indi individually more equipped to um, conserve biodiversity. So this is what, so we applied everything we learned in the forest to the classroom. We even taught um, data analysis using statistical programs and worked on writing and presentation. So, I don't know if we're going to have time for that, but I just want to let you know um, what's next for me um, is next on my list is Mashuala National Park. I am dying to go there. I did not have the opportunity to visit, but this pristine forest is the largest park in Madagascar and is full of natural treasures. I'm especially looking forward to visiting Nosimanga Bay, an island off the Mashuala Peninsula, and one of the very few places in Madagascar where you're almost guaranteed to see an eye. Almost. We'll see. But for now, how am I keeping busy? Um, I, during quarantine, I have been occupying myself by personally partaking in hashtag 100 lemurs on social media. Uh, 100 lemurs is an international collaboration between the Duke Lemur Center and Rachel Hudson, an award-winning wildlife illustrator. And together they are highlighting the incredible diversity of lemurs and why the most endangered group of mammals on earth, the lemurs, are in urgent need of our protection. So I have joined their effort on my own, posting a photo per day of wild lemurs I encountered in Madagascar. And you can follow me on the platform of your choice. Uh, we're not even halfway done with 100 lemurs and I have plenty of wildlife photography to keep flooding your feeds even after the, we reach the 100th lemur. I would also like to take a moment to thank my team for their efforts, expertise and support as well as all our collaborators and donors. We are funded almost entirely through donations and uh, your grants, um, I mean, your donations uh, and our, our contribution to um, really turning our dreams into realities. 
And lastly, if you are interested in learning more about our projects or would like to make a direct donation to Sava Conservation, please visit our website. And again, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, you can go back in this video and I've provided my email and three different social media accounts. And I hope that you enjoy and that we meet someday in Madagascar, hopefully. Fantastic, Laura. What a fun presentation that was. Man, uh, if you want to come out of screen share and people can check out the YouTube video later for that link, I have linked Sava Conservation into the YouTube chat bar. It'd be great to see you as we dive in with Q&A. That was awesome. And by the way, the not only the record number of slides in any presentation ever in the history of this program, you covered so much ground. That was awesome. But also the only, and I think probably ever only, uh, use the phrase nutrition dense bugger with regard to a bug or any other creature. Um, so thank you for <laughs> that. that was awesome. Um, all right. Uh, I think we can all agree, everyone who tuned in on YouTube, that you are a fantastic photographer. And so a question we got numerous times was, what kind of camera were you using for all this? Because it's... <laughs> So um, I'm shooting with a Nikon 5200, and I've had it for quite some time. Let me see, because I have two cameras. Yeah, my main one is the D5200, and I usually shoot with a 300 lens, and I always make sure to have my macro lens handy um, for any insects. Fantastic. Thanks, Laura. All right, uh, Alana wants to know, can you talk about some of your favorite foods in the Sava region? Yes, absolutely. Um, so... I definitely had an obsession with pao. So that's P-A-O. And pao is a, um, is a Asian dumpling, you know, um, it's like a very soft doughy bread and they fill them with different things. So it could be pork or chicken. Sometimes they do sweets and I love them. Um, I love the savory ones. And there was a time there where I had to have one every single day and things were getting bad. My pants were getting pretty tight. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds delicious. I go just for the food. Um, all right. Uh, a lot of people were asking about predators and lemurs. Did you see any Fusa when you were out in the field? You didn't have pictures of one in a huge block there. So yes, that one was not mine. Um, the only Fusa I saw was at the zoo, and I was not posting his picture. Um, and I, the only ones that we bumped into were the ringtail mongoose. And I actually got to see them a lot. So I actually saw them actively searching for mouse lemurs, going to trees and into tree holes, digging stuff out. And you just see debris falling and you look up and it's just this mongoose desperately looking for um, different animals in the crevices and holes of trees. Yeah, how cool is that? I have a question because you, oh, go ahead. No, Laura, what were you gonna say? I was just gonna say that uh, I think that one of the coolest things that I learned was that um, there's actually a lemur that e is a predator. The Mirza, one of the dwarf lemurs, is a lemur eater himself, believe it or not. I have never heard that in any of our Madagascar presentations. That's awesome. See, we're learning things every day. This is awesome, guys. Okay, you are in love with animals, we can tell. Um, do you have a favorite? As we always get it with animal presentations, is there anything that jumps out to you? Bonobos. First little bit of that. Bonobos. Oh, really? Yeah. So not a Madagascar animal. No, no. Um, I, I love all primates and I think that bonobos are just so fascinating. I really feel that um, if humans knew more about them, they might reflect a little bit more on <laughs> their own uh, consciousness and I think that we really do have the choice. Do we want to be chimps or bonobos? I choose bonobo. <laughs> Beautiful sentiment. We've only ever brought up bonobos in a few of our presentations ever, so I'm glad we checked that out. In fact, I'd encourage everyone at home on YouTube, check out bonobos when you're done. They're very interesting. They're, they're like chimpanzees in a way, but they have very different cultural sort of practices and they're a very different species. It's a, a great answer. Thanks, uh, uh, Laura. All right, Elena also wants to know, Did you? how did you communicate with people? Was it Malagasy, French, English, a mix of all three? What were you, how were you talking to people? So something that was very fortunate for me was that I was always with a veteran team. So James has been the program coordinator, has been uh, going to Madagascar for over 12 years now. And he speaks fluent Malagasy, so he is always able to help. But a lot of the people we worked with already spoke English and French and German or Spanish. And it was really amazing. Um, you know, tourism has really uh, influenced a lot of languages in the country and it was not difficult. Um, I also downloaded an app 
And while I would have internet, I would um, put in common phrases and questions and things that I think that I would use. And it would just allow me to download all those things and keep them when I didn't have internet. And so I could just point a lot <laughs> to my phone. It's the way to get around in a lot of countries in the world. It's fantastic. Yeah. So you've already highlighted what's next. You want to go to this different region, Madagascar. Are you, I mean, as a primate lover with primates all around the world, are you totally set on Madagascar for the rest of your career? I mean, certainly I've, I've scarcely had someone come on and be so passionate about a region or country that we, we've ever had in one of these programs. So is this your whole life? Are you super, yeah, are you going to be here forever? Um, I, I'm not big on plans. Okay. Um, if this is my destiny, I will embrace it, you know, um, wholeheartedly but I am open to whatever's going to happen. And perhaps, um, you know, career-wise, it would be really fascinating to focus on Madagascar. I think that it would take multiple lifetimes to truly understand and see everything. Um, but I, I know that as far as travel goes, definitely not. Um, there are, there's a big list of places that I got to hit up. Um, I think that outside of Madagascar, my number one choice would be Indonesia. I think that it is um, imperative uh, to see that before um, it's gone. Well, so this is a great segue into my next question with regards to Madagascar, in that this is a region that has had massive deforestation. I mean, there's a lot of troubles plaguing Madagascar. And so, you know, you're a very hopeful person. You highlighted all these amazing species. What can people do to help protect Madagascar wildlife and what needs to happen on the ground in Madagascar to protect this really unique ecosystem, in your opinion. So I did touch on illegal logging and like just being an ethical consumer. Find out where the vanilla comes from, where the stones come from, from where the woods come from. Um, people are not going to go and cut down these trees or mine the ground if there isn't somebody um, on the other side of a bank account waiting for the, these uh, resources that are on demand. So that's really like the number one thing that you can do. And of course, you know, um, if you can't do it yourself, um, if you can't donate your time, um, there are plenty of uh, different organizations that are doing great, great work in Madagascar. And if you just find out about them, you know, whoever, whoever seems to connect more with your vision, um, I say you support them either financially or perhaps with uh, gear or, you know, check out their wish lists online. I know Duke Lemur Center has one for our Duke, uh, for their lemurs in uh, Durham, as well as our uh, projects in Madagascar. Amazing. I'm so glad you brought up something there in that, ta in that answer uh, that we don't typically get in conservation programs, which is this idea that it's the people with the bank accounts that are ultimately the villains here. It's not local people that are burning down forests to subsist and to save their families. It's not necessarily even poachers who we, we tend to vilify and, you know, partially rightfully so, but ultimately those goods, those animals, those, you know, babies that are going for wildlife trafficking are ultimately going to someone. So if you cut that part of the source off, um, that makes a much bigger impact. And do donate. So I do want to highlight, I have to throw in the plug, uh, this weekend, starting tomorrow through Sunday, we're doing our Global Biodiversity Festival here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And one of the six organizations we're raising money for with that festival is Planet Madagascar, which is a nonprofit that works in the northwest of Madagascar in, in Karafansk National Park. So uh, donate, donate your time, donate your money, uh, get involved and learn more. I mean, presentations like this inform people about the, the majesty of such a beautiful place. And uh, I think that's really impactful for people. So. Thanks so much, Laura. We're gonna wrap up with one last question. If people wanna learn more about you, about the Duke Lemur Center, where can they go? Okay, so um, once this video is uploaded to YouTube or to the DLC website, you can just scroll through and in the last minute or so, you'll find the slide where I provide you with my email. You know, please anybody, uh, feel free to contact me with any you know, questions or comments. Um, and you can follow me on social media. I have an Instagram, Twitter, and a Facebook group that is public and open to anyone who's interested. Outstanding. Well, I'm certainly going to do that when I'm done this presentation. And I hope all you joining in on YouTube from all across the US and Canada, and again, welcome in, um, will do so as well. Laura, this has been fantastic. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jesse. All right, have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye everyone and see you all soon. Hopefully we can highlight some more great Duke Lemur stuff in the weeks to come.